Hi, friends. Welcome to Active Self Protection Extra. Today, I am with Terry Johnson from Firearms Legal Protection over Zoom. Man, we have a lot to talk about in the Kyle Rittenhouse case. It is now officially in the books. We've waited 72 hours. And the first question, we're going to do a whole series on Rittenhouse. And my first question I want to ask Terry is what does the verdict in the Rittenhouse case mean for self-defenders across the nation? To win the fight after the fight, you need help. After a use of force, I trust Firearms Legal Protection to help me win the fight for the rest of my life. From their 24-7 attorney answered hotline to coverage for the use of all legal tools, Firearms Legal Protection has you covered. Get a discount by signing up at the link below. So Terry, I know this is a little different because usually we're sitting in the same room on this, but you know, it's Thanksgiving week that we're filming this stuff. So thanks for coming on Zoom with me, man. Hey, it is always a pleasure to be able to talk to you and your subscribers and all the members of ASP. I mean, it's an honor because, again, the great thing is we're all sharing knowledge to make us all better. So thank you, John, for letting me come on to spread the word. Absolutely. So, OK, I know you watched the trial and followed it closely. I actually watched the trial. I didn't watch every minute of the trial. I'm going to be honest with you, I kind of had to work and all those things, too. Right. Um, but but watched a big chunk of the trial. And instead of getting our, our stuff from the media and from the hot take on what people said about things, we actually watched what was said in court. Uh, now, I'm going to say this to everybody here. We have not talked about what our answers are here. And uh, this first one I asked you is, what does this mean for self-defenders? And off camera, you said, you're not going to like my answer, John. So when I asked Terry, Terry, what does the Rittenhouse verdict mean for self-defenders in America today? What do you say? doesn't mean anything. I mean, I hate to say this, you know, I'm hearing people are saying this is a victory for 2A. This is a victory for self-defenders. No, it's a victory for Kyle Rittenhouse. And let me tell you why. You've got to think about it this way. Not, you're not going to get the same judge that he had. Right. You're not going to be in the same county. You're probably not going to be in the same state. You're not going to have the same set of facts. You're not going to have the same prosecutor. So there is nothing that can be gleaned out of this other than the law works. So, the, but the law in Wisconsin is different than the law in 49 other states. So, you know, again, I'm not trying to take away from the proverbial victory that we as, as uh, self-defenders have, you know, and related to this situation as it relates to Kyle Rittenhouse. But overall, no judge is going to say, hey, this happened in the Rittenhouse case, so I have to do this, or this happened over here and I must do that. It, it, it's, it's, it's a great moral victory. That's about it. So I think that's important for us to say, because I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, and we're going to talk about this. I want to talk about case law and in particular what this means and what Rittenhouse establishes as far as case law. We're going to talk about that in another video. But I think people think, oh, OK, well, now other courts are going to look to this and those things. But but the reality is, is that all the jury determined here is a very narrow thing that the jury said, oh, OK, given what the law actually says in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, then and given what we know of the established facts that happened in that day, what do these narrow facts with respect to this particular law mean? And that's really all they said, but people then expect that to mean something somewhere else. Why is that? Well, because again, people for the most part don't understand that every court, every state is different. Every county within each state is different. And sometimes you can have judges in the same building who see things completely different. Until it is a law, or whether it's um, codified or, or um, case law, until that happens, judges are going to do what they want to do. They are going to be the, the referees, per se, as you and I have talked about many the times. Umpire. Yep. And, and until somebody comes and says, nope, the strike zone can't be here, it's got to be here. Until things like that happen, they're going to continue to go about their daily business and making those types of decisions until it goes higher to a um, an, an appellate court or particularly the uh, Supreme Court of that state. Yeah. So I, I also want to talk about it in a broader sense. OK, so Kyle Rittenhouse is is free. The state can't retry him. He has been uh, you know, declared not guilty of all the charges against him. Full acquittal. OK, fine. 
So, so I, I think though, when we look at that on the outside, it says, oh, okay, Kyle was legal to be there. Uh, Kyle was um, uh, within his rights to defend himself with deadly force for the deadly threats that he faced in that moment. Um, and, and here's where we differentiate between legal, moral, and wise. Here's where we differentiate between what, what do I have the right to do? That's like I say, you know, sometimes you'll see these goofball sovereign citizens that will say, you know, oh, you know, I have these oh, yeah. rights. And, and that's true. Some of them are true. Some of them are goofy, but some of them are true. That doesn't make you morally right to assert your legal right. And then there's this idea of prudent, smart, wise. I, I saw a, a, an a interview with one of Kyle's attorneys who was pretty frustrated with a lot of people uh, offering him, you know, con congressional internships and um, kind of trying to trade on his fame and those things. Sure. And the attorney said something interesting to me. He said, you know, Kyle wishes every day that he was not there. Right. Right. Because to me, one of the things what this means for self-defenders is we got to look at a young man who stood in front of a jury of his peers and looked at the next 40 years of his life. And, and you said this to me several times, Terry, that before the verdicts were read, they weren't a done deal. They weren't a given. And do you really, you know, because we never know what a jury's going to do, right? Well, yeah, I mean, think about it. Um, and again, you look at it from the, the lens of who's judging. And, and let me tell you what I mean by that. If we get members on the jury who follow ask, that verdict would have been over and done with in about five minutes. Right. Yeah, it would have been a very fast deliberation. <laughs> exactly. Because, again, we understand self-defense. We believe this. We believe that. But what if it's on the other side? What if you get jurors that are anti-gun? Mm -hmm. Right. Who and they're a member of your community, too. Absolutely. And, and now all of a sudden you have that group and it would probably be over in five minutes the same way. Right. Right. So. Very few times do attorneys, you know, whether it's prosecutors or defense, get every single thing they want on a jury. And the unique thing about our system, from a criminal perspective, at least, is that you've got to have unanimous, uh, the, the verdict's got to be unanimous, not 10 out of 12, 11 out of 12. It's got to be 12 out of 12. And when you put all that together, um, that's very interesting for, let's say, again, one of your viewers talking to, to an anti-gun person sitting down and explaining to them what is self-defense and trying to come to a reasonable, reasonable uh, decision on this. And that, I'll, I'll tell you, I was very surprised. I, I didn't think he would be found guilty, but I thought based upon as time was going on and on and on, I thought it was going to be a hung jury on at least one count. Yeah, and they did come back with a unanimous verdict. And so that means at the end of things, they all agreed. And the judge asked even one, does anybody disagree with this decision? Are we all on the same page here? Yes, Your Honor, we all agree we're all on the same page. Okay, then uh, I think it was interesting that Judge Schrader actually thanked the jury, said it was one of the best juries he's ever, he's ever worked with, that they were very reasonable and, and did all that stuff too. But the thing that stood out to me was, again, the attorney said Kyle wishes today that he was never there. He wishes. And, and so he realizes as a 17 year old kid, he was he was imprudent. It was imprudent yes. for him to be there. Now, being imprudent doesn't mean illegal. Right. Uh, we do right. imprudent stuff all the time. You know, I, I eat Mexican food sometimes and it's highly imprudent. Right. But that yes. doesn't mean it's illegal. Right. Exactly. And, and so, you know, he did a thing. He shouldn't have necessarily been there to defend somebody else's property because that was unwise. It wasn't his to begin with. Uh, but, but, but it's legal with his presence, right? Maybe, maybe carrying an AR-15 into there wasn't the smartest thing because of, of what that signals to other people. But it was legal. And so, but when he stood in front of that jury, Terry, I'd love to get your thoughts on this because I could see in his eyes as the jury came back in that that kid was wearing the weight of the world. He was wearing the weight of the rest of his life. And so it said to me, the only time you want to use deadly force is if the, the alternative is so dire that you're not willing to stand before 12 people who may not think like you do and hand them the rest of your life. Yeah. And, and, you know, listen, I've been in that situation before, you know, um, the, um, second most stressed person in that room would be his attorney. Of okay? course. Well, maybe and, his mom. 
Well, yeah, could be, but <laughs> you know, I having been in that situation, I can't explain to you what that feels like. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I, I could hear from, you know, my office where I was watching the verdict come in. I can hear him exhale yeah. when that verdict oh, yeah. came up. You know, um, and, and you're right, John. That's that's a great takeaway from this. You know. The, the interesting thing about this really is you have to have some things together in your head before you use lethal force. Because again, a lot of people were stuck on the wrong thing here. Like you just mentioned, should he have been there? Did he have a right to have a gun? What else could he have done? You know, he shouldn't have been this. And how do you separate all of those things out and literally get 12 people that are smart enough to sit there and, and again, push the BS to the side, look at the law, apply the law to the facts or the yep. facts to the law and say, he's not guilty. Well, and not only that, but I think avoid the social pressure of, but what message are we sending in other areas? That's not the jury's job. The jury's job Correct. is not to worry about optics. The jury's job is to apply the law to the situation, to the, to the facts. And, yeah. and it, it seems they did that. They didn't, you know, it, it's, I heard so many things and I went on a few uh, uh, TV shows and interviews and they were calling him a white supremacist. And I, I'll say, I'll tell you what I said to every station I went on. He's got to be the worst white supremacist I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, no you kidding. know I mean? He shot three other white people. Um, you would think a white supremacist would go after, you know, someone that doesn't look like him. It, yeah. But again, it's the narrative that, that gets out there. And again, and I'm sure we'll talk about in another video about what the prosecution and defense does, because again, you're asking 12 people to honestly not go out and listen to the rest of the world. Just listen to what comes into that courtroom and make a decision just on that. And remember, this jury was not sequestered, which really surprised me. Very much surprised me, really surprised me that they were not sequestered. But, but again, so A, that kid was wearing the weight of the world on his shoulders. That's a lesson for all of us. If you use deadly force, your life will never be the same again. Uh, and, and Kyle Rittenhouse, I know some people are like, oh, he's going to make money on the speaking circuit. He'll have jobs available to him, this and that. Yes, and he's also going to have to look over his shoulder. Uh, I've also seen death threats on social media. And uh, his life will never be the same. And again, what, that tells me that I only want to use deadly force if the consequences of not using deadly force are so vast that I can't live with them, that I can't, I couldn't possibly live with them. I think the second takeaway in my mind is you might beat the charges, but you won't beat the ride. That the yep. process was punishment. When people don't get that, you know, you, I, I have said many, many times, you do not want to be in the system. You, you don't. Anything from a traffic ticket all the way up to, in this case, first degree homicide, because again, the, Average person, 95% of the people aren't prepared to handle something like this, you know, because what most people want is, and and this is why we have plea deals at the rate we do, a lot of people just say, I just want this over and done with. Right. I just want this done. I just want this done. And I don't know if a deal was offered to to, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse or not. I don't think so, but maybe. But here's the thing. I've seen a lot of people say, yep, I I must have did something wrong. So I'll do this and I'll do that. And then years later, they look back and they regret that. I should have took it to court. I I've got to live with this on my record. I've got to live with that. Um, It is a lot of pressure to go through a trial. And it's something that you really, really can't understand unless you've been there. And here's the other part. You have to be prepared. And again, um, obviously, you, you, you see my background here, um, and I'll just take a quick moment and say, you know, yes, get some kind of legal protection. Obviously, you know, we believe firearms legal protection is the best. And, you know, you don't want to put yourself in a position where you've had to use deadly force, not only have to, having to go through all the things he went through, but again, you got to find money for all of this. You got to find money for expert witnesses. And money to get you out of jail. And let me tell you, GoFundMe does not allow criminal cases to be funded on their page, per se. Mm. 
So, so that's not an option. And so it's a lot to think about. It's a lot to, to bring in, but again, that's part of being prepared out there. You must have something um, just in case. And, and we really don't plan for the just in case. Well, and let me say at the end of this, it looked to me like Kyle Rittenhouse at 17. We don't expect a 17-year-old to have prudence very much. We don't expect a 17-year-old to connect uh, you know, out, actions to outcomes very well. That's part of being a teenager. But when it came to the use of deadly force, it sure looked to me like Kyle Rittenhouse didn't say, can I shoot these guys? He didn't say, should I shoot these guys? He waited until, if I don't shoot these guys, they're going to kill me. Um, and that was that must not. And uh, given yes. that, I think that the outcomes that he had were the best ones available to him. Standing in front of the jury was the best outcome available to him. Um, now, we could have said maybe the prosecutor should have you know, removed his head from his, uh, you know, orifice and, and not charged him to begin with. Uh, but that's a politics question. So I think he didn't have a choice. Yeah. In some sense, that's true. But, but in, in this case, I think Rittenhouse, again, I think he was imprudent to be there. I think that, that he would choose different if he could go back again, but in the moment he was justified to do what he did. So he had to do that. And so this outcome is the best one available to him given that he was there in the moment with the gun, right? Um, but for the lesson for all of us is avoid this if you possibly can. Don't use this to embolden you to go, yeah, I'm going to go to a, a riot or a protest and open carry my rifle. He only open carried the rifle because he couldn't carry a pistol legally and he couldn't conceal legally. Right. Okay? Uh, you learn those lessons too, right? Be the good, sane, sober, moral, prudent person and go, huh, what risks am I taking here? Am I willing to put myself at this risk for what gain? Um, and, uh, but also in the moment, recognize that the rest of your life is going to change. Next week, everybody, I want to talk about what case law got established by the Rittenhouse verdict. And Terry, I think is going to make us mad again. See you next week. <laughs> Thanks, John.